And we're live. Welcome to OrthodoxChristianTheology.com. This is Craig Trulia, and we're doing a show today because I think it's ultra important to do a show on gnomic will and Maximus the, Maximus the Confessor's teaching of it. Now, there's two main books we're going to be drawing from which are extremely important, and that is Disputation with Pyrrhus. So we see here it's translated by Joseph Farrell. And um, we have the responses or questions of Thalassius. And this is translated, I think, by Nick, Father Nicholas Contus. Why am I covering these books? In short, the reason we're talking about this issue, because people really misunderstand what happened during the fall and what human nature really is. Now, I got into this topic because you look at the reason right behind me. I don't know. I'm pointing backwards. There we go. The Theotokos. And for about nine months or so, I've been doing a, a serious investigation of the Orthodox doctrines of the Theotokos. Um, I've read Father Caps before then, and I've never seen a really straightforward teaching. Um, the only one I did see was from um, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, St. John Maximovich. And St. John Maximovich seemed to have not a very good presentation in that he could poke a lot of holes in it. And I did actually write a long video on this with a Roman Catholic. He poked all sorts of holes and made all sorts of problems. Now, upon further uh, reflection and studying, I can now see that St. John Maximovich is absolutely right. But it shows how someone could write humbly and straightforward and not very fancy words, um, and presume you understand the fathers like he does. And it could come across, because it's humble, that it's somehow not up to snuff when it comes to apologetics. And because he wrote it for Orthodox, it really isn't an apologetic work. When you read St. John Maxovich, is uh, several different chapters he has in the Theotokos in his book. But that led me to a more serious investigation, what the Orthodox Church, Church teaches. Um, I got in touch with a monk. I won't speak of the jurisdiction. And pretty much he kept giving me a homework assignment. <laughs> and we would talk and go over the homework assignments. And what became very clear, without him even telling me the answers, him giving me the books to read, Exposition Orthodox Faith, all the Dormition homilies, all, you know, essentially the nativity homilies and such, these different Marian homilies, what began to crystallize was how simple the Orthodox doctrine is on Mary and how wrong the Roman Catholic doctrine is if you understand the patristics. And what I've come to realize is people don't. <laughs> That's why we've been unable to give a good defense of the Orthodox doctrine of Mary. Because quite frankly, most Orthodox don't know it. They just don't know. We're not Protestants. We're not Roman Catholics. We don't believe what the Protestants believe. We don't believe what the Roman Catholics believe. But that's not a belief. That's a, I guess in a sense it is. It's a negation of things. But that's hard to grapple with. Now, this is not going to be a webcast on everything on that topic. It's going to be a webcast on what St. Maximus teaches is the nature of the will. It's particularly gnomic will. Because if you understand this teaching on my website, orthodoxchristiantheology.com. I have from the scriptures and from the fathers. We have second, third century already up. I'll have an article soon on St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. John Chrysostom. You'll find before St. Maximus, the fathers taught the same thing about gnomic will, about prelapsarian will. So what I'm telling you is not some strange opinion from Maximus. This is the teaching of the church. And this Relation with Mary is if you understand it, you'll realize how little sense the Roman Catholic doctrine of Immaculate Conception makes. In fact, it cannot work. This is why I've called the Immaculate Conception the glass jaw of Roman Catholicism. You don't need to get into debates about the filioque. You don't need to get into debates about ecclesiology. This is by far the easiest way to disprove Roman Catholicism because it's so simple, so clear. It's taught by all the saints, and it cannot be contradicted without saying the saints are wrong. And this is why in an earlier video, which I did with a Roman Catholic, his argument was Augustine's wrong, Maximus is wrong, 
this saint's wrong, Basil's wrong, everyone's wrong, right? Because once you realize this is what all the saints teach, you just have to say they're wrong in order to teach that the Immaculate Conception exists. So when I happened upon this, it was so simple, it blew my mind. So that's my introduction to this. Now let's define nomic will. Nomic will very simply means that our mind has opposing views of what's good. Or to put more simply, we're not sure of what's right, what's wrong. And that's why we sin, right? Most people aren't as complete sociopaths. And I think even the sociopaths tell themselves they're doing the right thing. Now, obviously, someone before the fall couldn't be a sociopath. Someone before the fall couldn't be unsure, you know, as in always constantly dithering between right and wrong. Now, already some Roman Catholic is going to say, wait, no, because Adam chose to eat the apple. And, you know, and Eve, she went back and forth with Satan. And this is why we have to go over what Maximus teaches, because it's not about your opinion. It's about the teaching of the saints and what nomic will is. So we're going to start with a very simple definition, which is nomic will is constantly in your mind going back and forth of what's right, what's wrong. Now, there is an actual definition that Maximus gives, and I'm going to give it to you, but I wanted to start with the kind of simpler layman's terms so you can actually follow what I'm talking about. And I will give references so you can follow up in these books. Um, and the definition Maximus gives for number will is it's nothing else, he says, than an act of willing in a particular way in relation to a, some assumed good. This is in paragraph 85 of Disputations of Pyrrhus. So I'm going to repeat that definition. No will, or the nomi, he says, is nothing else than an act of willing in a particular way in relation to a, some assumed good. And Pyrrhus responds, I would regard this as the correct interpretation of the patristic definition. Now, for those who don't know Disputations of Pyrrhus very well, it supposedly... Remember, uh, Socratic dialogues are John Archer, so we have to take this as the minutes of a disputation. But it's supposedly the minutes of a disputation that did occur in North Africa, where the Bishop of Constantinople went to visit North Africa and disputed with Maximus concerning um, the issue of monothelitism, the issue of the one Roman Christ. Now, what Maximus took issue with is that um, the monothelites actually called the one will of Christ nomic will. And then Maximus makes this argument that no, no will doesn't mean that in the patristics. It means, to repeat, is nothing else than an act of will in a particular relation, a particular way in relation to, his own, to some assumed good. So the question is, what is willing in relation to some assumed good? Is this natural to man? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, what's interesting, first I'm going to give a footnote. So I'm going to give the answer from Maximus. So, and guys, let me know for one reason the audio is not coming in. But you're going to get an answer from Maximus. But first, so people don't think I'm nuts, I'm going to give you what Oxford PhD, um, I think it's Joseph Farrell. I don't want to get it wrong with some other Farrell. Um, the translator of this book, uh, Joseph or John? Joseph. Now I feel less stupid. He says in the 90th footnote, that for St. Maximus, the fall of man is precisely a fall into a dialectic of oppositions. All right, so I'm going to repeat that. For St. Maximus, the fall of man is precisely a fall into a dialectic of oppositions, which means in plain English that you're not sure what's right or wrong, kind of what I just told you. So the translator understands Maximus to mean this happens after the fall. This is what the fall is. So what I'm going to do in this video is show you for Maximus that this is correct, that the scholar is not incorrect in this. Now, um, I don't want to get the names wrong because so I'm going by memory. There's Dr. Heidgerken. He has actually the most recent book on St. Maximus, Maximus. It's not even out yet. It should be out sometime this year or next year. It's going to be obviously based on his PhD dissertation, which is already out. So Dr. Heidgerken is a Roman Catholic scholar, um, and I think his name is Blowers. I don't want to get it wrong. He's a Protestant scholar. He is um, the editor of, you know, a patristic academic peer-reviewed journal. Um, all the people in the know when it comes to Maximus, 
admit this is the definition of gnomic will. It's prelapsarian. So the main reason this is important when it comes to the Theotokos, for example, is the fathers teach that she had gnomic will. Now, there's no sentence that says Mary had gnomic will. That would be ridiculous. But when they speak of Mary dealing with, um, for example, doubts and dealing with needing correction so that she could be doing the right thing or dealing with not being sure. So they go a great length, for example. Mary's not sure if the angel, what the angel's telling her is actually correct. Um, or when Jesus has to give her, you know, it's not the right time for me to make the water into wine. Um, these different things, because Roman Catholics don't understand Maximus, they don't see anything bad about them because it's true. It's not like a sin to have no will, right? God doesn't hold it against you. There's a difference between an effect of the fall and an evil work which acts against you in the judgment. Those are two different things. So that being said, Roman Catholics, because they don't understand that, Maximus, don't realize that all these examples of gnomic will are proof that Mary has a post-lapsarian body and soul. It utterly disproves the Immaculate Conception. You don't have to get into anything else because that is the fall. The fall is, as the scholar says, this dialectic of oppositions. It's precisely what the fall is. So anyway, let's get into showing this for Maximus. So Maximus, and um, I want to get this right. And, uh, oh, man, do I not have the reference here? That would stink. I'll have to look it up. But uh, I think it's somewhere after paragraph 86 in the actual um, disputation of Pyrus. Maximus says this. It is not possible to say that this appropriated human will by Jesus is a gnomic will for how is it possible for a will to proceed from a will? Now footnote 51 says, that is if the will is hypostatic, how can a particular mode of willing, the human and gnomic, come from another mode of willing? So thus, those who say that there is a gnomi in, in Christ, a gnomic will that means, as this inquiry is demonstrated, are maintaining that he's a mere man, oh, this is paragraph 52, that he's a mere man deliberate in a manner like us, having ignorance, doubt, opposition, since only since one only deliberates about something which is doubtful. By the way, no, this is not paragraph 152. Now this is annoying me. I'm going to take the paragraph real fast. Hopefully I am quick. Um, yes, this is paragraph 87 of Unification uh, of Pyrus. So I'll have to make a note of that so I don't screw up in the future. So anyway, in paragraph 87, we will continue. So... He say, no, Jesus is not a mere man deliberating a matter like unto us, having ignorance, doubt, opposition, since one only deliberates about something which is doubtful. By nature, we have an appetite simply for what by nature is good. So again, this is now by nature what human nature is. But we gain experience of the goal in a particular way through inquiry and counsel. Because of this, then, gnomic wills fitly ascribed to us, being a mode of employment of the will and not a principle of nature. All right, so we're going to stop there for a second, right? By nature, we're inclined towards the good because human nature is good, right? God made man, it was good, Genesis 1. This is Christianity 101, all right? But after the fall, we, right, we're trying to do what's good, but we're not quite sure, and it's through inquiry, right, asking questions by counsel, by being taught what is right, right? So by theosis, by sanctification, that we gain experience in the goal. All right. So that's why Maximus says gnomic will is fitly ascribed to us being a, mo a mode of employment of the will and not a principle of nature, because it's not natural to man to have constant inquiry, doubt, opposition, deliberating about something that's doubtful. That's not natural. That's not prelapsarian. This is what Maximus is saying. Why? Maximus continues. Otherwise, nature itself would change innumerable times. Right? It wouldn't have natural stability. That's the term that Irenaeus uses. So I'm going to continue. But the humanity of Christ does not simply subsist similar to us, but divinely. All right, We're going to get a little more into that in a moment. It is thus not possible to say that Christ had a gnomic will. For the same had been said, subsisting divinely, and thus naturally had an inclination to the good and drawn away from evil. Isaiah said the same thing. This is actually Isaiah being quoted in St. Basil. 
Before the child knew or advanced in evil, he chose the good because he also said, before the child knows good and, and to refuse the evil, he chose the good. This is Isaiah 7.15 from the Septuagint. For what the word before indicates that he had by nature what is good, not inquiring, deliberating as we do, but because he subsisted divinely by virtue of his very being. Now, this is important. Why is this important? Because there's a reason why Jesus has no nomic will, but it's not simply because Jesus had no sin or Jesus was prelapsed. That's actually not the answer that Maximus is given. He's saying Jesus had a single, single divine hypostasis as in union, union, right, with human nature, right, hypostatic union. So Jesus had a single divine hypostasis, so his human will was always cooperating with the divine will. Right? He had a divinized human will. That's why when Jesus was, before he knew good or evil, according to his human wisdom, right? In the Gospel of Luke says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Um, so before, right, he quotes Isaiah 7.15, the child knew or advanced in evil, he chose the good. Before the child knows good and to refuse evil, he chose the good. So that is the quotation that he's using as a proof text. The reason that's relevant, it means Jesus, before he knew good or evil, by default always chose good. Well, how's that possible if he couldn't will good? Well, he because he didn't know good or evil. It's because the divine hypostasis, the human will, always cooperated with the divine will. Now, again, you never hear Roman Catholics talk about this because they don't really understand, the, you know, diophelitism. They don't understand the two wills. They don't understand Maximus. Um, a big problem is, uh, again, because the Sixth Ecumenical Council has still not been translated into English, for example, to this day. So that being said, this is important because it shows that the reason why we won't fall like Adam, even though Adam had no sin, is because in heaven, that is, is because in heaven we will have divinized nooses, we'll have a divinized will. So our will will always cooperate with God, unlike Adam though he had no nomic will, did not have a divinized noose, which Christ had by default, remember? He had a divine hypostasis. So because of that, Adam could be deceived and fall. Now, this was very important for Maximus because he had to make clear what human nature was so he could make clear that the Nestorian and monophysite views of divine will were incorrect because their view was that Christ could only, for example, monophysites, Christ could only have a divine will because otherwise the human will is always contrary to the will of God. That's actually what they believed, even the Pilapsarian will, which is interesting, but always opposed to the will of God. Now, the Nestorians believed that Christ had a human and divine hypostasis and that the divine hypostasis, right, or the human hypostasis always like – had a harmony by kind of a union of cooperation. It, it willed and decided to, to go with the divine will. Now, the reason why the Nestorian teaching teaches that, because it's essentially the same view of the human hypostasis that monophysitism has. They're cut from the same cloth in that sense. Um, and so that way, Nestorianism, that's how they answer why Christ didn't have sin and couldn't sin. But there's a defect in both those ways of reasoning because it presumes that essentially before the fall, the will was already fallen. It's, it's always in opposition to God, which is incorrect, right? How could man actually be saved if he's already in opposite, by default opposition to God without losing his human hypostasis? That's a major problem. I think the Nestorians can answer this more easily than the monophysites um, can, you know, to try to solve that conundrum. But this was the conundrum that Maximus was trying to solve. This is so important. Um, so this is, and let me know if for a reason the audio is still bad. This is what Maximus is trying to solve. So he solves it like this. No, human will is always inclined towards good. The only way it doesn't choose good is really just gets deceived of what the divine will is. Now, if the human will is in fact divinized, right, like Christ. He has a divine hypostasis. The human will is in the divine hypostasis. It will always accord with the will of the divine will. But with the saints or us in heaven, when we are among the saints, 
we will have divinized nooses. Our human will will be divinized and thereby will always cooperate with the divine will. It actually answers how a human being could be saved. Monophysitism and Nestorianism actually can't answer that, though I think you could try to make a more, a better case for Nestorianism, but it always comes to some sort of adoptionism in some sense, right? You will, you, you will lose what authentically means to be human in that sense. Um, so it's not really an answer, but monophysitism just cannot work. And really, this is why all the Christological doctrines are important, because they preserve who Christ is, and they preserve the sacramental life, and they preserve how we can be saved. That's why they're important. So I'm going to continue from Maximus. Um, our last important text from uh, Disputation of Pyrus is paragraph 152. Because he, he very clearly says, no McWill, no McWill is sinful. Um, and he says in paragraph 152, and he's criticizing a former uh, patriarch, Constantinople, who kept changing his mind of what um, kind of will Christ had. And so in this conversation, he makes the following observation. He says, and yet at another time, he admitted the opinion of those who say that it is Christ that, that, it, which is Christ's will, is freely choosing a gnomic and is thus not content to make the Lord simply a mere man, but a mutable and sinful man as well. Why? Because the nomi is a judgment concerning opposing things and inquiry into things still unknown and a choice between uncertain things. Now, there's a lot packed in here, and I'm going to focus very quickly. I'm going to on what make the Lord simply a mere man, but a mutable and sinful man as well. He's saying there's two wrong things here. What are these two wrong things? Let me read the footnote because it's going to make it a little clearer. Footnote 92, it states, having established that the gnomic will is the mode of willing proper to the created human hypostasis, St. Maximus then demonstrates that the attribution of a gnomic will to Christ would imply the existence of human hypostasis to him, thus making him a mere man. So the statement to make the Lord simply a mere man means that only a human hypostasis could fall, right? A divine hypostasis cannot, cannot fall. That's impossible. So only human hypostasis could fall. So that's why he says, saying Christ had gnomic will makes the Lord simply mere man, that he had a mere human hypostasis, like the Nestorians, right? That's not right. Now I want to focus on the next statement, which is important because it's going to help us now understand the next the next book, the, these questions of Palacios. He says, but a mutable and sinful man as well. So there's two men, right? Two wrong men. Christ is not a mere man, right? He doesn't have a human hypostasis. He's a divine hypostasis. There's a hypostatic union. This is what the Council of Ephesus is about. But also, he's not a mutable and sinful man as well. Why is that important? Because gnomic will only belongs to mutable and sinful men. It does only belongs to the post-lapsarian man. And this is important because there's some confusion over this, um, even in Orthodox circles. But it doesn't confuse Dr. Heidgerken. It doesn't confuse... Dr. Farrell, it doesn't confuse, um, I, I want to get the, I'm going by memory, Dr. Blowers. It doesn't confuse people that are, that they actually stated by, I think, Blowers. It's a consensus of the scholars that no will didn't exist before the fall. So this is not my opinion. But now we're going to absolutely prove this by looking at Maximus's next book. All right. So that being said, we're going to read. Question for Thalassius, this is 21, paragraph 4. All right, so question 21, paragraph 4. Now, when we read this, it's important to understand that the word free choice or freely choosing is another euphemism for gnomic will, or as we're going to find out, the will before the fall, but when it was uncorrupted. You know, it, Maximus talks about the difference between uncorrupted free choice and corrupted free choice. And we're going to find that out in a second. But we even already saw that in paragraph 152 of Disputation with Pyrrhus, because Maximus called it freely choosing a gnomic. So this, this is a common euphemism. So anyway, now, knowing that, just to remind you, he's not going to use the word gnomic will in question to the He's going to use the word free choice. 
He writes now in paragraph, uh, in question 21, paragraph four, in the passibility of Adam, that means after the fall from incorruption, on account of sin, that the wicked demons conducted their invisible operations concealed under the law of contingent human nature. Thus, it was only to be expected that on account of the flesh, they beheld Adam's passable nature and God the Savior, and thought that in this contingent state, he was necessarily a mere man, subject to the law of nature, but not moved by the inclination of his will. That's extremely important. Adam before the fall is a mere man, subject to whatever the law of nature is at that time, or he's subject to natural law, but not moved by the inclination of his will. So he had a natural stability. This is a euphemism for no nomic will. All right, why is this important? They therefore assailed him, hoping that they might prevail even upon him through his natural passibility to form an image in his mind of an unnatural passion and act on it as they would. That's important. So Adam couldn't just be suggested a sin. Now the Damascene talks about this in uh, book three of the Expedition Orthodox Faith, paragraph 20. He calls it an external assault of passion. He says only Jesus was externally assaulted and only Adam was externally assaulted. Now we see right here uh, um, what Maximus is talking about, that the Satan saw Jesus was looking like Adam and presumed to make Jesus fall, that he had to um, assail upon him so that an image would be formed upon his mind because he would not be moved by the inclination of his will. He had no nomic will. So this is a admission that Adam before the fall had no nomic will, but Adam could still sin, which is honestly what happened. So how to form an image in his mind? Because this is soon, if you read more questions of Thalassius, image, like kind of imagination is what creates sin in um, Maximus's viewpoint. So once you form the imagination of sin, it now allows eternal assaults of passion. So this is what Maximus is talking about. So he continues, he is God and master, this is Jesus, and by nature free from all passions, right? Divine hypostasis. Instead, he by means of our temptations, the wicked power, he provoked by means of our temptation, the wicked power thwarting it by his own attack and putting to death the very power that expected to thwart him just as it had thwarted Adam in the beginning. So meaning Jesus purposely took on weakness, took on human flesh, so that the Satan would attack him. And this, in a sense, was attack on Satan, right? So by surviving those external assaults and not sinning, that now cancels the fall. Man joined to Christ will now no longer be affected by those assaults of passion, and we can now enter that dispassionate, non-nomic state. So not only not be moved by inclination of the will, but also not being dispassionate and divinized. So this is what Christ is doing, right? This is how Christ is saving us. Now, in the Apuscalum uh, Theologicum et Polemicum, Maximus says this a little more succinctly. It's in Apuscala uh, 1. He writes, Christ's human nature does not like us move according to free choice, right? According to Nomic will. But having received by its virtue, uh, sorry, having but having received its being by virtue of its union with God, the word, right, his human nature, it possesses an unwavering movement. It possesses the natural appetitive movement of its free choice in a condition of natural stability, right? That is the natural prelapsarian mode of man. That's what Jesus has, and he can preserve that because he has a divine hypostasis. He has a, a human and divine will within a divine hypostasis. Christ does not have two hypostases, otherwise there'd be four persons in the Trinity, right? There's only three hypostases in the Trinity. Now, this is not some wacky idea from Maximus because Irenaeus talks about the same exact thing. And I'm looking for a quote from Irenaeus really fast. Um, now, Irenaeus says in paragraph 11, um, by de in demonstration of the apostolic preaching, 
when he speaks of Adam, he says, moreover, he was free and self-controlled, being made by God for this end, that he might rule all those things that were upon the earth, right? So free and self-controlled compared to um, what it says about Jesus, right? It possesses the natural appetite of movement of its free choice in the condition of natural stability, right? F free and self-controlled, free choice, natural stability. This is the same thing. Irenaeus also says, it was not possible for them, Adam and Eve, this is in paragraph 14, demonstration for apostolic preaching, to conceive and understand anything of that which by wickedness through lust and shameful desires is born in the human soul. For they were at that time entire preserving their own nature since they had the breath of life which was breathed on their creation. And while this breath remains in its place and power, it has no comprehension and understanding of things that are base, right? This is preserving nature, just like the argument Maximus just made, right? Having received its being by virtue of its union with God, the word possesses unwavering movement. It possesses the natural appetite of movement of its free choice and condition of natural stability. They're talking about the same thing. So continuing with the questions of Thalassius, responses to Thalassius, whatever name you want to give this. Um, in question 42, paragraph 2, Maximus now gives us the answer. Well, what's the difference, right? Because remember, Maximus is really not trying to solve the fall. He's trying to solve why Jesus didn't have no will, what human will was in Christ. This is what Maximus is saying. So someone now could get confused and say, well, the reason Jesus didn't have no will was simply because they had a divine hypostasis, and therefore, therefore, therefore Adam had a no will before the fall. This is also incorrect, though. Why? We're going to read, now here's the answer. Question 42, paragraph 2 says, because Adam's natural free choice was corrupted first, it corrupted nature together with itself, meaning free choice now being corrupted, losing the grace of impassibility, meaning the will before then was impassable. This is important, right? It was not passable. It was not no will. Remember what uh, Maximus said in the beginning, that no will had passability? In fact, let me scroll up to that real quick because you will miss this because he's speaking about the same thing. Um, da, 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 da. Right, and applies uh, the, um, I want to find it real fast, and dead air is terrible. Um, I want to find it fast. Right, it says that he's a, a mere man delivering an opposition like unto us, having... Ignorance, doubt, opposition, since only one only deliberates about something which is doubtful. Um, by nature, we have an appetite simply for what is good, but we gain by experience the goal in a particular way through inquiry counsel. Because of this, then no will is fitly ascribed to us, being a mode of employing the will, not a principle of nature. Otherwise, nature would change innumerable times, right? Meaning it would be passable. It would, it would change all the time. Um, and we see this also in paragraph 152 of Disputation of Pyrrhus. That would make the Lord a mere man, but also a mutable, right? A mutable and sinful man as well. So, right, it's the will before the fall wasn't this mutable, passable thing. It was always inclined towards the good. So we're going to go, okay, well, then how did Adam fall then? We're going to give the answer to that in a second. But, right, I'm just going to reiterate. Adam's natural power for each choice was corrupted first, and this corrupted nature together with itself, losing the grace of impassibility. And thus the fall of free choice from the good toward evil became the first and blameworthy sin, right? The fall of free choice, the introduction of gnomic will was the original sin. It was the original sin. That image entered Adam's mind of choosing something other than the God, and that became passion. That became an eternal soul of passion. This is so important because this is what Maximus talks about in nauseam. If you go, oh, well, Craig, you didn't give enough detail. Read the book. When you read the book, you're going to see him absolutely right. I'm just giving the highlights here. So we're going to now go forward to question 61, Scolio 1. Pleasure and pain, he says, this is Maximus speaking in third person, we're not created together with the nature of the flesh. Instead, the transgression conceived both the former, right? Transgression actually conceives. 
resulting in the corruption of free choice, right? That imagination. And the latter resulting in condemnation and dissolution, dissolution of nature so that pleasure bring, bring about the soul's voluntary death through sin. So again, we see that was imagination, the contemplating of sin became the corruption of free choice, which was before then impassable, right? Which was in a natural state of good, of choosing good. And there we have it, is what we see is there's no gnomic will before the fall. I'm gonna give one last proof text. Question 64, paragraph six. Maximus is giving an allegorical view of the book of Jonah. <clears throat> And I wish I had a cup of water, but I'm going to try to muscle through it. He says, human life during the fall was submerged in temptations and which was encompassed by the final abyss that is imprisoned by the complete ignorance of the intellect and overwhelmed by the great weight of evil passing down on its power of reason. And as much as human nature was receptive to their deception and evil, it initially entered into these clefts. But later, nature itself became their very basis, right? By nature, this was not possible. It was only when the intellect became overwhelmed by a weight of evil pressing down its power of reason, because reason naturally is inclined towards good. It's the imagination of maybe that's not good. That is when sin enters in. Now, people don't think of it this way because they're always obsessed with guilt, like doing something bad is sin, but it's deeper than that. It's not knowing the good. You couldn't sin if that weren't the case. Not wanting good, thinking you're wanting good, but not sure. That's how sin enters in. This is what Maximus solved. But as we already seen, and like I said, there's articles on my website. The fathers taught this. Maximus was not the first. He just put it very succinctly. I'm going to continue. But later, nature itself became the very basis on account of its most wicked disposition, possessing like eternal bars, innate attachments to material things, which do not permit the mind to be free from the darkness of ignorance. So, right, we really don't have free will anymore, right? We have corrupted free choice. It's not real free will. And so prevent it from beholding the light of true ignorance. So it's important why I'm, I'm saying this. You can't say free choice, like when he says uh, Adam had free choice or Christ had free choice. There's a difference between free choice and corrupted free choice. Adam before the fall and obviously Jesus had free will, but wasn't free will as in nomic will. It wasn't corrupted free choice. And I think I just lost my video. No, I didn't, thankfully. Right? There's a difference between that. It's free choice that's corrupted and then um, imprisoned by ignorance and darkness. This is nomic will. So let me offer you a conclusion that will help you sum this up. Nomic will definition is willing a relation to some assumed good. Next point, the assuming of good instead of the knowing of good makes possible the choosing of evil in place of good. For example, people think it is good to acquire wealth, to be vain, or any number of sins. All right? And I'm starting back camera. So they think these things. But um, any of these number of sins, right, people may think they're good, but this is their way of thinking because the fall occurred. You couldn't think this way before the fall. There's a reason why Adam and Eve were deceived. So when the word became incarnate, he only had a single hypostasis, which united the divine and human. For this reason, even before Jesus grew in human wisdom, his human will always willed what the divine will desired. And in fact, it was not possible for Jesus' human will to will contrary to his divine will, right? It's not even possible. Just like a divinized human will right? That's uh, by grace divinized, not by nature like Christ. Um, it's not possible either. Hence, it was impossible for nomic will to exist in Christ. Yet, my last point, Adam likewise had a will which exhibited natural stability. That's a quote from Maximus. And willing in relation to some, and no willing in relation to some assumed good, right? It was naturally inclined to good. In fact, the moment Adam did will in relation to an assumed good, right? The moment that happens, right? When he assumed something was good other than God's will, the fall of free choice occurred and free will is henceforth corrupted. So that's why nomic will can't precede the fall because nomic will is what started the fall. It's as simple as that. So congratulations, audience. You are now an expert on nomic will. And so 
I have a very small audience because I didn't announce the show in advance. I just pulled together the last second. And I otherwise, I'm not going to be fielding a lot of questions. There will be more on this, not on this channel. It will be on a, another big channel, hopefully. And I'm sure I'll get a ton of questions and you can save more questions for them. Whatever you write in YouTube, in the comment box, I may or may not get back to. But if you got questions now, you can ask them. So there's this question from Orpheus, and this is the only written question we have. And so you better ask it quick if you want your question answered. Aren't human appetites types of will? Like hunger, thirst, pain, lust, trepidation, did pre-resurrected Christ not have these physical inclinations? Good question. Now, yes, Christ cannot hunger with the divine will. The divine will does not hunger. It's utterly impossible. Christ did not be tired of the divine will. So that's what Maximus points out in Disputation of Piracy. Monophysitism does not make sense because the divine will cannot do these things. It's impossible. You, you'd be making the divine will passable. So how's it happen? I, I think that's what Orpheus is trying to say. Well, then how does this happen then? <laughs> well, let's answer this question very simply. One, the um, Christ had an authentic human will, right? You have to have a human will to do this. And so, right, we've got to preserve correct teaching. There's not four persons. So there can't be a human hypostasis, but also there has to be a human will or these things can happen. So how could a divinized human will do this? The answer is given by Maximus, John of Damascus, um, and actually earlier fathers, and a lot of people don't get this, is that the, that Christ's human and divine will, in book four of Exhibition or I know it's actually book three, he thinks paragraph 23, spontaneously, Damascene says, spontaneously, voluntarily decided to become hungry, voluntarily decided to become tired, because Christ had no sin. These things only enter at the fall. It's only possible if Christ voluntarily assumed these things. So this is kind of like a landmine because people are afraid of uh, Julianism, which is a, a kind of afrotodocetism. It's a kind of heresy. So actually a monophysite heresy, but also a kind of Gnostic heresy, docetism. So they're like combined. And so Christ was authentically corruptible. He actually corrupted. He got older. He didn't appear too corrupt. He actually got older, died. It's in all our confessions that he was corrupted. But he wasn't corruptible by nature. That's very important. He voluntarily willed to corrupt. But when he didn't will it, his body didn't see decay. Because Christ was not fallen. Christ did not have to decay. He did not have to die. The fathers talk about this. He voluntarily allowed himself to die. By the way, you'll see that in saints' lives too. But they're always mimicking what Christ did. So Christ voluntarily assumed these things. This is the answer given by so many saints and prayers in the church. But it's an extremely important doctrine because it explains why not only why monophysitism is wrong, why Nestorianism is wrong, um, why Afro, 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 how do you pronounce it, Docetism is wrong. It explains why Christ is not post-lapsarian, he's pre-lapsarian. Christ was conceived without sin. Christ had no sin. And Christ didn't just simply will, okay, I'm going to have a, a sinful body. Because that's already wrong. Wrong. I think it's Romans 8 too. Christ had the likeness of sinful flesh. The likeness. It was not sinful flesh. Just look up the fathers and I talk about that. He had the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, it wasn't mere appearance, right? It didn't just appear to be sinful, right? It didn't just appear to corrupt because it actually corrupted. It actually hungered. It actually thirsted. It actually got tired. But Christ, human divine will, voluntarily assumed these things, right? Even for the human will would have even been conscious about it, like when he was an infant. So that's a great question, but I hope you guys realize, right, how this all ties in together, how important this is, because it shows who Christ really was. It shows who we really are. And what I came to realize, it shows who Mary really was, right? how Mary's will cooperated with God. And I'm going to read one more thing from Maximus um, because it helps us understand something about Mary, which is really what got me into this. Why was Mary, why did Mary not sin? How did Mary have this grace not to sin? It's more than, it's not just magic. We're all baptized. Chrysostom says that, Chrysostom says that baptism, it's possible for us never to sin. So why don't we never sin? 
Maximus gives an answer to this. It's in question 6-2 of questions of Thalassius. He says, for the spirit does not give second birth, baptism, to a disposition of the will without the consent of that will, but to the extent that will is willing, he transforms and divinizes it. This is important. And the fathers, or people that aren't fathers, Archbishop Michael talked about this three years ago in his Paschal letter. Um, that baptism is not magic. It resets sin. It makes you dispassionate. But your will has to cooperate with what God has done, has to with the grace of God. Mary perfectly cooperated with the grace of God. She never sinned. And so that's why a divinized will that always cooperates with God's grace for eternity, with God's energy, will never sin and will always grow more like God. But also, as we can see, God doesn't, Jesus didn't have this by grace. He had a divine hypostasis. He had this by nature. So we can see the sacramental reality. We can see the cooperation of wills. They're all connected. That's how human, Jesus was authentically human. That's how Mary did not sin. That's how we are saved in heaven. That's how we won't fall in heaven like uh, Origen speculated. Um, it answers all the questions. That's how we know it's correct. And as I talk about, it's in Irenaeus. It's in the scriptures. It's in later fathers. It's in St. Gregory Nyssa. It's in Chrysostom. It's in all of the important saints. So I want to end the show on that note because we got no other great questions. And I want you guys to consider blessing. If this show has blessed you, bless Orthodox Christian Theology com slash donate. Right? The I am raising money for the church in Cambodia under the Bosco Patriarchy. So go to Orthodox Christian Theology com slash donate. No donation is too small. Um, otherwise, donate to your local monastery. Donate in that uh, link. Donate directly to that church. I give the uh, money wiring directions to the Moscow Patriarchy, however you like to do it. But bless someone else if this has blessed you. Um, so that is it for today. I hope this helps you understand Maximus. Thank you for watching and God bless.